See, we have that with insurance. It's all right to collect insurance. Everybody collects insurance. You have your car wreck, insurance it pays everybody, so it's okay. But we don't get the message when it comes to how to help poor, downtrodden, needy people that we identified as such. So the world's going to be full of people with troubles and problems. How are we going to help them without engendering rage? How are we going to help them without engendering a loss of their humanity and their own self-worth? I think Buddhism needs to hold on to its teachings that we help all sentient beings, that we all suffer. Every single one of us does. We are all brothers and sisters in suffering. That's why we have compassion for one another, because we understand what it's like to be a human. We, we know what it's like to have trouble with a child. We know what it's like to have a sick person in your life. We all know that. It doesn't matter how much money you have. We know that suffering. So we have compassion for one another. And we can, we can help one another at that level. So I see many problems coming in the world. And I really believe that the Buddhists have some answers which are absolutely crucial to answering those problems. I didn't always feel this, but I do now. I feel that we have reached a time when the future needs to be rescued. And I think that it can be rescued in part by part of the way in which the Buddhists teach. And that informed Buddhist, and you've got to be informed. Don't just run out there and think all of us can solve these if we're not informed. The informed person must start. As the Buddhists always say, you first inform yourself and then you inform somebody else. But you've got to do it for yourself. And so a group like what you have here To me, you are an informed Buddhist group. You must also now begin to think about, and this is the last point I'll make, you must begin to think about how can you inform others of what you have. You cannot just leave it in this room. That's why I recommend to everybody, you must recognize that when the Buddha taught, he had a little trouble. He had no iPhone, he had no text messaging, he had no books, he had no radio, he had no television, he had no internet. He didn't have any of that. It was face to face. Today we have all of those. Would he use them? I think so. Would he make use of those out of compassion to make sure that the message gets out as far as possible? Blogs. I used to make fun of blogs. Social network. I used to make fun of Twitter. I thought, oh, yeah, the kids love it. They'll get tired of it. (laughs) Then I look at my TV screen, and here is Egypt. Where did that all come from? Basically, it came from Twitter. It's deadly serious. Social networking is not a game. It's where communication is today, without question. There are a billion Twitter messages a day, a billion. They grow every day. And they are mainly not in the developed countries. They are in the underdeveloped countries because it's their major way of communicating with each other. So... I think that um, I had that experience. I gave this lecture at the University of California, San Diego, and they said, here, sign this paper. You sign away all your rights. We can do with your lecture whatever we want. And I signed away my rights. A friend of mine who's in the entertainment business said, never sign away your rights. (laughs) But I was happy to do it. Then I began to get emails from people who said, I saw your lecture, and I thought, what are they talking about? I don't even know what it was. I didn't know they put it on YouTube. I had no knowledge that that had actually been done. 
So I spoke to 250 people on the campus when I gave that lecture, and now close to 60,000 have seen it on the internet. It's like the Buddha net. <laughs> it really is. You know, Buddha net is run by a little place in Australia. They have about 80 people who come to their group, and they do up to 800,000 hits a day. So we all must turn to this new media. We need to Twitter and Facebook. We need to do all of the issues and blogging. I started <clears throat> in Google, you know, you can, you can just do your search in a blog, in the blogs. Any, how many of you ever just done that? Search the blogs? You all ought to do it. I, I searched Buddhist Library Singapore in the blogs. I think there are about 8,000 blogs for this, your own group. Have you ever read them? Do you know what people are saying in those blogs? I decided that I should go through and try to look at the blogs and think, what are people saying in the blogs about Buddhism? So I've started putting in a bunch of words. I had these nicely in my slides. <laughs> I can't quote you all the figures exactly, but what I discovered was that, for example, here in Singapore, if you try to look at the blogs for religion, there's no question about it that Islam is on top. The blogging about Islam and Singapore far outstretches Christianity and Buddhism by a long shot. Why is that? Why do they have so much publicity? That's a lot of publicity where you have something where they have five times the number of blogs of other religious groups. We need to look at that information and ask ourselves the question, what is it that we have and what is it that somebody else is doing? So <clears throat> When I go through and look at what's really the most crucial thing in the blogs tied to Buddhism, the one that has the most hits, what do you think it is? Anybody want to take a guess? What other word would... Mind. Isn't that interesting? Buddhism and the mind in the blogs is one of the most dominant comment, commented things about the tradition worldwide in the blogs. So we need to look in all these new avenues and try to understand how people are seeing it. And it's very serious. I, I met the man who crunches all the Twitter every day. He takes a billion Twitters and he looks at the messages. And to me, I, I just, when he started talking, I thought, there's nothing more mundane than a Twitter message. I will see you at 10 at the store. <laughs> I'm on my way to school. I would, the, the Twitter messages, I thought, are so mundane. He makes a fortune from Twitter. And his fortune from Twitter is he can crunch the numbers on Twitter, and he can tell Hollywood how successful a movie will be five weeks before it opens. And it works. Fox Pictures didn't believe it. They said, you have to prove it to us. So they gave him a movie, and he proved to them that his predictions were far above the stock market predictions for how that would do. And it was just from Twitter. So every time you do a Twitter, if you say a positive or negative thing, <laughs> nowadays it's being studied by industry at all levels. They want to know what's out there. And I think Buddhism needs to think seriously about this too. If we want to know what's happening in the world with regard to Buddhism, it's in that milieu. And it's not unknown. It's not missing. It's just that we need to go and try to look at it and understand it and to enter in and participate in that world if we wish. Because if we don't, someone else will do it. 
So a group that wishes to inform others, I think that's what you have to do. So I'm very happy to be with you. I'm sorry to give you all sort of the bad news. I'm, I usually am not so much of a downer, but it's, we live in, in very interesting times. And as I said, I think we live in times when we really need to look seriously at what Buddhism has to offer for these problems. And that's why groups like this are absolutely crucial and important for the world. So thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.